Welcome back to the GTN show. Yep, Hayden Wild has announced that he plans to do an Ironman, not just any old Ironman either. Yeah, and Jasmine Paris has completed the Barkley Marathons. Yep, and a punchy start list for Challenge Roth has been announced. Okay, starting so as we always do with React, some of the stuff we've noticed over the internet, and it was all over the internet this week. If you'd missed it, I don't know how. In fact, it was even on like BBC Breakfast. Jasmine Paris has completed the Barclay Marathons, and this is pretty historic because in the race's history, no woman has ever completed all five laps. Do you want to tell them a little bit about what the Barclay Marathons are for? Our, we, we, yeah, we talk, know? we talk about this every year and for a very good reason because the event is nuts. I mean, first off, just trying to get into the event, there's all sorts of requirements, submitting an essay, coming along with a vehicle registration. Um, and, uh, and the race starts with the race director lighting a cigarette. Yeah, you there's, get there's the no picture. Gun, just everyone watches him for an hour or two and at some point he lights a cigarette and that means go. <laughs> <laughs> and then you complete five laps of this course which are essentially the same loop but you do it in a different direction each time and therefore you're going through 60 hours so different lights so every time it feels different but on each of those loops you have to collect pages from a book and it has to be the number page you are wearing on your bit. Uh, it's it orienteering meets trail running meets epic endurance event. And in the history, only 20 people have finished it. And Jasmine Paris is the first woman to have finished it. You have to finish it under 60 hours. And she finished with 99 seconds <laughs> to spare. She just got there, literally hustled her way to touch that gate to finish and collapsed on the gate. It is pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, made history. Uh, Five runners did finish this year. It's also a record uh, to have five finishes in one year. The other four were men. The race was won by Ihor Veris, a Ukrainian who lives in Canada. Uh, and then John Kelly finished second, Jared Campbell in third, and Greg Hamilton from New Zealand in fourth with Jasmine Paris, as we said, just sneaking in under that 60-hour cutoff. It is a pretty epic event. And one, actually... I'm kind of going to dabble with this year because yeah. I'm not obviously doing the Barclay Marathon, but I'm doing the Berkeley Marathons, which is a place in the UK. Uh, they have got approval from Lazarus Lake, the founder of this event, uh, to recreate it here in the UK and essentially doing the same format. Uh, so in August of this year, I will be doing the Berkeley Marathons run by Gert Lush Events. And if you want to come along and join me, you're very welcome to do so. Or you can just stay tuned and watch me go through that pain in a video on GTN in the near future. So Mark's never done a 100 miler. I have not. Now he's doing a 100 miler with uh, alternates and orienteering <laughs> in, in, mixed in there. Yeah. And, uh, and a newborn baby just thrown into the mix. So yeah, what yeah. could possibly so, go yeah, wrong? What could possibly oh. go wrong? This is going to be an entertaining video. <laughs> okay, moving on. Triathlon related news. Hayden Wilde, as he prepares for the Olympic Games, has posted this post. Uh, I'm a niece. Uh, Ricky, see you in 2025. <laughs> Do you think it's genuine? Uh, probably not. He's taking the p***s, isn't he? Like, uh, he's getting ready for the Olympics. He's not thinking about doing Ironman World Champs, is he? Don't know. <laughs> I mean, he is good at non-drafting racing, as we've seen on the 70.3 distance. Uh, I think it's probably just a chance he just happened to be in the area and end up on the course and went, Ha, this will be yeah. funny. Um, <laughs> but you never know. Get the people talking. It could work. Which he's done. So, yeah. Uh, it, I mean, he could do it if anyone can. So, yeah. And we'd be very excited to see him on the start line. Uh, but, yeah, he hasn't done any Ironmans yet. So, probably just wishful thinking. And then we saw this one, which I'm going to call Speedy Gonzalez, because uh, it's uh, on the World Triathlon's uh, Instagram post. And this is a kick for the finish line. Wow, that is... Uh... One heck of a thing. Do you think he got it wrong? I, so watching it again, I think he might have because the finish line's always on the blue carpet, right? And he was coming up to a blue carpet and he sprinted onto the blue carpet and then realised that's just a transition blue carpet. There's another gap of like 400 metres before the finish line like, blue oh, carpet no. stop. And then, yeah, maybe it was a really badly timed sprint for the finish, I, but he managed to hang on. I mean, there's surges and then there's full on full gas attacks and that was a full yeah, gas that was attack a, sprint for I the I mean finish. he held it on he got to the finish line so hats well off done, to him mate. but that was a very risky move <laughs> and I do think maybe he just uh, 
chose the wrong finish line, Dave. Well done. Well done. <laughs> well, done. Uh, well, moving on. Uh, obviously, not such great news. We um, saw Kat Matthews pull out of the recent T100 uh, due to a calf issue, and she's actually had it further checks, and um, it turns out it's quite a bad injury. Yeah, she's had it scanned. She re- said she was reluctant to have it scanned because she figured she, it's a cough tear. You know what it is. You can tell immediately what it is. But uh, she did have it scanned eventually because it seemed a little bit uh, worse than that. And it is a soleus grade 2C, uh, and the doctor said you need to double the rehab time because the C means that there is um, a basically involvement of connective tissue, the tendon. And so eight to 12 weeks is the rehab Ooh. time with uh, Ironman, Ironman Texas on her plan for only, I think, six weeks time or five weeks yeah. time. Uh, yeah, I, I think she might be in a little bit of denial and thinking, oh, it's not as bad as they say it's going to come right. But uh, yeah, not a great way to start the season, your first race of the season in March. And a horrible tear. So we wish her well on uh, yeah. recovering as quickly as possible and see her back out there racing. But yeah, probably not a good idea to rush it to get ready for Texas, is it? <laughs> no. Um, all right, we're moving on. Um, did you see this clip over the weekend from the Katera World Cup? See it. It was Dramatic. doing the rounds on social media. <laughs> um, for I've I've seen seat posts or like a sad a seat post actually breaking, but not essentially half the bike. Uh, let's be honest. I, I mean, no matter how bad his mount was, yeah. there is no way he landed on pretty much any bike with enough force to do that to it, to completely take the seat post off. There was clearly something pre-existing on that bike. He obviously flew there, possibly with a soft case bag, and uh, the airline had done some serious damage to his frame that he didn't notice. Uh, but yeah, he landed on that bike and it just disintegrated underneath him. And yeah, that must have been some airline damage, I think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you don't you don't see that, do you? Uh, I I have a friend. Check your box when you've flown with it. I have a friend that actually was in the London Olympic Games and did the whole forty kilometer bike leg with no saddle on his road bike. I don't think uh, I don't think uh, Henry Gra- Hen- uh, Henry Graff uh, carried on and did that. He was uh, looking pretty flabbergasted at his yeah. bike. Like, what the hell just happened? Yeah, good question. What did happen? Okay, next one. Uh, so this is a bit of a scary one. Ever heard of a flesh-eating bacteria? So the cyclist from British Columbia in Canada went on a training camp uh, in San Diego and got a bit of a saddle sore. And the last day of camp, he was feeling like a bit fluey. Uh, went to a clinic to have it checked out. And 36 hours later, he was apparently fighting for his life and still is. Uh, uh, he had a flesh-eating bacteria that had managed to get into that saddle sore and had left him, well, yeah, in a really, really bad way. I, that is terrifying. Yeah. I mean, I've had saddle sores, but that is next level. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, it basically, the flesh-eating bacteria can get in anywhere. Um, it's called necrotizing fasciitis, and it does, just needs a tiny little cut or saw or whatever, and he was just clearly unlucky. It wasn't, this isn't something that happens. I was gonna say, I'm not riding my bike yeah, anymore. <laughs> this isn't something that happens to cyclists, no, yeah. and uh, is particularly prevalent in the chamois pad of, of certain brands. Or anything. No, it is just, he was incredibly unlucky. Uh, he is, though, however, fighting for his life, and he is raising funds. Uh, we'll put the link for those, uh, that. GoFundMe page uh, on, on the screen or below the, the video now because, uh, yeah, he's looking for some support. He's in a pretty bad way. He was in uh, ICU for a while and, yeah, he's quite literally fighting for his life. It was scary stuff. Okay, moving on to try news. And we're going to kick off with the Roth start list. Now, it's obviously a big event each year and it's always exciting to see which athletes are going to be lining up and duking it out there. And it is... Looking like it's going to be a good yeah, one. Yeah, we're a bit worried that this might be a bit of a non-event this year with so many with the Ironman Pro Series mm. and the T100 Series kind of pulling all the pros' attention to two things that definitely aren't Roth. But it doesn't look like that's actually an issue. I got first and second place from last year. Magnus Ditlev, who uh, is going for a three-peat, three in a row. He also got the world's fastest time there last year of uh, seven hours 24. Uh, so he's going, and he says he hopes he can beat it. He said, I'm happy to announce I'll have a go at a three-peat at Challenge Roth this summer. The race holds such a special place in my heart, the amazing atmosphere, the great people of Roth, and of course, a fast and challenging course that suits me. Uh, so yeah, he'll be back. But also second place there, who ran a 230 marathon, uh, last year, we'll be looking to go under that 2.30, I imagine. Uh, Patrick Langer uh, is also going, and he will obviously be looking to get one over on Magnus Didlev. Mm. But they're not the only ones. I mean, obviously, 
there are many more athletes still probably to announce and yeah, decide early what days they're doing. The, the um, two, but yeah. currently we also have Rui von Berg, which I believe is the first time he would have done it. Rothen, which is quite exciting. Yeah. Um, Leon Chevalier, Daniel Backgaard, Clement Mignon, um, Jan Stratman, Kyle Smith, and Peter Hemerick. Pretty, pretty stacked field. Any one of those guys. Excited about uh, that one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the women's side, so far, early days, only a few have been announced. Laura Phillip and Lisa Norden will definitely be going head to head. Svenja Toes and Laura Siddle are also on the list, and I uh, imagine a few more ladies will be added closer to the time. So, yeah, Challenge Roth shaping up to be a good one. Hopefully, we can go there too. Now it's time for What The Tech, and uh, we've noticed this from Body Rocket. If you remember, we saw Body Rocket was all installed on Christian Blumenfeld's bike uh, at Kona, well, his spare bike, and they've done all kinds of aerodynamic testing on it. Basically, it's a system that completely separates the rider from the bike while out in the real world. So you can kind of get the drag effect of certain positions while out in the real world. It's essentially a wind tunnel attached to your bike because obviously the issue is when you compare wind tunnel data to outside data the fact that you are attached to your bike and that you can't you can't kind of measure the actual effect in the real world you're either in a very controlled environment in a wind tunnel and you can get the drag effect of certain things or you're out in the real world you can't get the drag effect but you can't get the speed effect so so they're trying to split the difference and go now you get wind tunnel based data the drag effect of different positions, etc., whilst on your bike. And they do this by putting a, disconnecting the saddle essentially from the bike with a sensor, disconnecting the stem from the bike with a sensor, and disconnecting the pedals from the bike with a sensor so that they can measure all those forces going through each of those positions between the rider and the bike and therefore tell all kinds of things. Exactly how many things they can tell we're not entirely sure of. But we saw this on his time trial bike and it makes a lot of sense for time trial bikes because it's you against the wind, essentially. Now, they put it on Christian Blumenfeld's Olympic Games bike, which is interesting. It is interesting um, because, I mean, the essence of the racing is you're in a pack, hopefully, draft legal racing. So the benefit, whilst there is obviously aerodynamic benefits, it's fairly marginal, it's small in comparison to a time trial. And if you're not optimized in your aerodynamics, you could just spend 10 seconds less in the wind before you drop back into the pack, as opposed to... You so, so, like, don't get me wrong, there is absolutely a benefit, of course, and that's why we have aero road bikes. Yeah. There's a benefit behind them. It's just a heck of a lot of work for <laughs> margin, absolute marginal gains. But this is the Olympic um, reigning champion, and um, maybe he's planning a solo attack. Wow, there you go. Oh, Mark, yeah. You heard it here first. Mark has put it out there. Christian <laughs> Blumenfeld goes on a solo attack uh, to win the Olympic Games solo in a draft legal event. I'm not sure that's the case. I think they're just looking for every game yeah. they can. So they've installed it on his giant Propel, a road bike. And obviously, this does also mean that once they've got the system functional on a road bike, because until now it's only been on a time trial system, uh, they could use it for all kinds of other things, the testing of positions for pro cyclists, etc. So it is interesting to see. It is some new tech. It is very niche tech. Well, I get, I, here we go. Hear me out on this bit, actually. I mean, I guess the, the Norwegians have bought into it, and it is good technology, and obviously Body Rocket are working closely with them, and they, they are benefiting from it. Both sides are benefiting from the partnership. And the technology is obviously fantastic. Let's be honest, it's quite bulky. And the way in which you have to sort of take the parts off and attach things on, it'll likely develop with time. And the Norwegian are helping them in that. So yeah, but watch this space, see, perhaps. Perhaps. I'm not sure I can see a practical, like, where people are, like, going online, ordering it, and a box arrives with a seat post stem pedal that you mount. I mean, if you it's look probably at the, not marketed, if you look at where it's mounted on it, the, the mounting on his crank set, for example, that's not something you do at home. Yeah, and it's, it's specific to bikes and models of bikes as well. Obviously, yeah. the handlebar, the stem has to be specific mm -hmm. to that bike. So yeah, it's really interesting, and we've been watching it quite closely, uh, monitoring sort of its progress because it is fantastic and really interesting technology. Um, so yeah, I They're think definitely pushing the envelope, uh, but it is still very much a case at this point of. What the tech is that? <laughs> and moving on to the race news. Um, I mean, this literally is taking over our show because there's so many races and things coming up. We At are last the season is starting. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, first off with the X Terra World Cup. It's kicked off. First stop of the seven stop tour. Um, first off in Taiwan. Um, the men's side was won by Felix Frizier ahead of Jens uh, Nilsson and Arthur Frizier in third. And on the women's side, Solène Bion took the win ahead of Alizé Patiz with Marta Mendito in third. French 1-2-3 there. The French well done, really dominate ladies. x terra There was also 70.3 Geelong this past weekend. Uh, Ellie Saltas taking the win there ahead of Grace Tech with Lottie Wilms in third. Yeah, and men's side it was Sam Osborne that took the win there. A while since I've seen Sam Osborne top of the... Um, Tom Bishop in second and then Henrik Gush in third. Yeah, and then we had the World Cup in Hong Kong, which is the first time they've had a World Cup in Hong Kong sprint distance race. And uh, yeah, it was pretty fierce racing. This on the back of uh, Abu Dhabi WTCS getting cancelled. Quite a few athletes looking to score points and looking to secure that Olympic qualification. So we've kind of got a overly stacked World Cup fields happening at the moment, which is great for us, uh, but it does make it a little bit interesting as far as uh, qualification goes. Uh, on the elite men's size, we saw already uh, Alberto Gonzalez Garcia, Speedy Gonzalez, uh, making that sprint and holding on for the win ahead of Antonio Serrat Seon and Kenji Nena, uh, Japanese. Uh, taking third there. Yeah, and then on the women's side, this is quite interesting, we saw Sean Rainsley taking the win there, and she's been, well, coming back from injury for some time now, a serious talent, um, but really kind of showing that she is back. Yeah. Uh, it's quite impressive. And ahead of none other than Katie Seferis in second and Kirsten Casper in third, so quite the athletes to trump. Katie Seferis and Kirsten Casper competing head-to-head uh, -head with a few mm. others to get those American slots for the Olympic Games. Uh, then we had the European Triathlon Cup in Quateria in Portugal, uh, and this was an Olympic distance race, and the story of the day, I think, was British uh, Hugo Milner, who we've spoken about before of his exploits in cross-country, where he uh, ran cross-country really well. Clearly, this guy can run. He ran at 29.32. Coming off out of transition, 30 seconds down, he ran almost a minute into everyone ahead of him and more than 30 seconds faster than anyone in the race uh, to have the fastest run split in 29.32 to take the win ahead of none other than Vincent Louis, who was also on the comeback trail sort of from injury. Uh, and we're looking forward to him getting into shape for the Olympic Games uh, with uh, Aurelian Jim in third. Yeah, he is going to be someone we need to keep an eye on, isn't he, Hugo Milner? Yeah. There's quite a few people we need to keep an eye on now. Really like, yeah. longer and longer. <laughs> uh, on the women's side, it was uh, Lisa Tersh that took the win ahead of Cassandra Bogrand, and then in third, Georgia Taylor Brown. Yeah, Lisa um, Tersh really showing it. Those are two medalists there, uh, mm. and she is uh, outrunning them, I think. Another one that we're going to need to keep our <laughs> eye on going into the Olympic Games. Uh, good to see Georgia Taylor Brown, though, coming back from injury there and, uh, and having a decent race. Uh, this all puts into contrast or into, into stock relief the difficult decisions that are coming up for selectors uh, the Olympic Games is coming up and there are not that many slots and a whole lot of contenders for it uh, actually someone interviewed uh, Mark Cavendish the British performance director uh, who is tasked with actually making this decision uh, and he said uh, quite honestly it keeps me up at night already thinking about which of those we're going to pick. Uh, the first selection meeting we've already had wasn't short, and I imagine it's going to be a pretty long one next, uh, the next one. Yeah, that selection meeting, that final selection meeting will happen after the 25th of May and the Cagliari WTCS race, which is Olympic distance, and essentially it all comes down to who performs well there. No pressure. <laughs> uh, well, moving on and to upcoming races. And what's interesting is this particular race, it was typically kind of one of the races that kick-started the season. I'm a 70.3 Oceanside. Um, it yeah. is kick-starting the Pro Series. It's the first it one is, in Ironman's Pro Series. but so much racing has actually already <laughs> happened, which is kind of like crazy. This is where we've got to, which is amazing for the sport. It's time. also that weekend you have Oceanside, the following weekend you have T100 Singapore, and you have the uh, Super, Super Tri... What's it called now? Super Tri e, e Games in London. So everything is kicking off all at once within two weeks. It's just all happening. Amazing. Anyway, the start list has been announced for uh, Oceanside, and it is stacked. Taylor Nib is going to be lining up there, and against previous winners Paula Findlay and Tamara Jewett. So they're in the mix, obviously. Uh, Emma Pallant brown after her DNF uh, in Miami, will be uh, looking to bounce back from that. Grace Tech of Australia, Daniel Lewis, Laura Brandon, Maya Stage Nielsen, all on the women's side alone. 
Yeah, and then on the men's side, we've got Sam Long planning to do the double. He's going to do the T100 in Singapore the following weekend. Wow, that's oh. a bit of a travel, isn't it? Yeah. Between... Uh, Patrick Langer, we've also got Jackson Laundry, um, Lionel Sanders. Um, that's before we also get on to some short course athletes coming across. Um, Ellie Keynes. Yeah, he'd be looking to do game. what uh, Leo Berger did last year and uh, stick it to, mm, the, to the middle distance boys. Lots of racing coming up. All right, now it's time for the pin board and some of the things you guys have sent us. And we're looking for something new for the new month of April. April Fools. So something funny, comedic, fail that you had uh, at a triathlon. Doesn't necessarily have to have uh, video or photographic evidence, although that does help obviously show it on the show. So if you don't have photographic evidence, but it's a funny story, Upload that still with just a photo of yourself in the race or doing another race uh, because we'll still tell a story. But if you do have video or photographic evidence, even better, such as this one, which came from uh, Neil in Greece in Cyprus, or in Cyprus. Uh, it said, uh, post -reco race recovery fail. After completing the Cyprus half marathon as a training run, I needed to sit down whilst waiting and cheering others to the finish line. I did not lose a drop of my beer. <laughs> That's. <laughs> <laughs> Not what you want when your legs yeah, are a bit sore, do you? Retracting bollard. Well, I've got to ask, what is your biggest race fail? Oh, Triathlon fail. So many to choose from no, over the too, years. Yeah. yeah, I did an Xterra once and uh, left my swim skin on. Like, oh. I pulled it down to my waist while I was running out of the water and then I, I somehow, you know, you're putting mountain bike shoes on, it's all a little bit different and I'm ran and jumped onto my bike. Uh, my wife was standing there screeching at me. I don't know what she was shouting, why she wasn't just cheering me on. And then I realized I still have my swim skin on my lower half. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's not great. <laughs> Hilarious. No video, evidence. no video evidence of that one, though. If you have something that does have video evidence, send it to us. Are yours, Mark? Uh, We've got some video evidence of a really bad mount. Yeah, that one has done the rounds. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah, show it again now. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I also did do that once in a race as well. Um, uh, I uh, well, also there was all, this was almost quite bad actually, but actually I can just laugh about no, it now. I can laugh at it. Um, someone we we sort of caught wheels and handlebars on a descent in the Alps um, during a race, and the I kind of got unhooked. But in unhooking myself, it sent me flying into an apple orchard on a big switchback. So I did like a Lance Armstrong esque feet out of the pedals, going through this apple orchard, just hanging on for dear life. But I cut straight through the apple orchard in front of the pack and just carried on with the race. All oh, right, you did a full-on Lance Armstrong, <laughs> did you? I mean, you nearly died, but hilarious <laughs> in hindsight. Yeah. Hopefully you guys didn't nearly <laughs> die for your fails. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't want to see anyone nearly dying, but hopefully there's some fails, even if it's just equipment failure that uh, happened during a race. We'd love to see it. So send it in, use the upload on screen right now. Say what? So, okay, last week uh, I discussed on the show Iron Man's new rules where they have banned aero hacks or attempted to ban aero hacks without putting it in so many words. The word, the, the rules are kind of open to interpretation. They're very vague to put it mildly. Yeah, I, I wasn't actually here last week on the show. Um, and I gotta say, I, I kind of briefly brushed through the rules and I was, uh, and yeah, like, it could basically yeah. make every bike pretty illegal much, pretty if you wanted. Pretty much everything is like, what are you actually trying to say here? I mean, clearly they were trying to ban like bottles down the suit, but then not word that by saying, we have our banned bottles down the suit. So they've banned it as using things that you might or uh, otherwise be added to your suit or your calf sleeves to gain an aerodynamic advantage. Which just made it so vague that you don't know what is banned. Anyway, someone commented on that video. Kieran, oh, Kieran Zero said, Do new Iron Man rules effectively make wheel covers like Easy Disc illegal? That's a variant intended to reduce air resistance, which is now banned according to the rules. Same thing for their crank and derailleur covers, which are also fairings that are designed to reduce air resistance, which are now banned according to the rules. Uh, so actually what we saw was Easy Gains uh, posted something on Instagram saying, Ironman rule announcement on March 13th, we received written confirmation from Global Operations, rules and special projects at Ironman Group that Ironman permits wheel covers in all Ironman events. Uh, here is the ruling confirmation as it's written and basically it specifies that they are allowed to use their Easy Gains disc covers. 
which is a fairing designed to reduce air resistance. So now, does that mean the whole rule is just thrown out or is it other fairings, but we're not sure which fairings. Uh, they do go on to say, both the existing and new rules need interpretation as they could invalidate any bike on the market if used verbatim, which is how rules are supposed to be, that you can yeah. read them and use them verbatim without interpreting them. Uh, the chain ring cover and the front derailleur guard has been used many times at multiple Ironman races, including the 2023 Ironman World Champs by a professional athlete. While the existing rule was in place, we don't believe the changes to the rules will make a difference to this. So they, they believe, well, they've got to confirm that you can use the easy disc cover and they believe that their chain ring covers will still be allowed too, which then obviously makes you think, well, what else is... Uh, yeah, uh, they did it. say, as you can imagine, it's been a very stressful few days for the Easy Gains <laughs> team, but we are delighted to re receive written confirmation that Easy Disc can be used at Ironman events going forward. I mean, there's many bikes that people are riding and they're having to put aftermarket parts on, such as front hydration systems and things like this to make them work and be suitable for a long-distance triathlon, um, to make them comfortable, to have everything there that they need. But now... You kind of you're going to be going to every race wondering whether yep. you're just going to get that job's worth of a official that's going to say <laughs> no, which do exist, oh. yeah, and just like go well, hold on, you can't use that. Take it off your bike. If you don't take it off your bike, you're disqualified. Uh, and then they've got to go through three thousand bikes to do that. And yeah, it just all gets a little a little difficult, doesn't yeah. it? Uh, I mean, some some clear wording would definitely make a difference. Yeah, uh, and actually, um, Jan Jensen said literally that. The aero rules are pretty vague. Are between the arm hydration systems slash bottles still allowed? Same for those storage boxes behind the down tube bottle. The tape rule it, rules is ne unnecessary. Athletes should be free to tape what they want provided safety is not in risk. The zipper rule is fine. Litter rules is fine. Yep. Yeah. So the zipper rule, they've clarified, you can now race with it unzipped, but it has to be attached at the bottom. You can't just have it flapping around, which, fair yeah, enough. Fair. And the litter rule, I mean, yeah, now bans and D DQs for littering, uh, five minute penalties and DQs for littering. Uh, I think that's not actually that different from previous. But these aero rules are difficult to swallow, especially the, the tape rule. I mean, all kinds of things happen on bikes. <laughs> And there are all number of reasons for putting tape on a bike. And it may have the added advantage of being slightly aerodynamic in that it covers a crack or something like that between your bottle and your frame or something. That doesn't mean you now ban the whole bike, does it? Well, it's good job Tyler Butterfield's not still racing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, remember his bike. <laughs> uh, yeah, really interesting. Let us know what you think about these new rules in the comment section down below. I think there's a video in it, James. We might have to go and do some testing, have a bit of fun with this. Um, but that is it for the show this week. We have got a really exciting video coming up, which we did say was coming last weekend, but it's coming this weekend. Still Retro coming. versus modern triathlon gear. We have literally gone and tested it in a wind tunnel. Yeah, it's in his, fun. In his speedo and a singlet. Mark. If you like that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, if you're into that sort of thing. Also, if you're looking for something to watch right now, uh, we did a very interesting video on how often should I swim in a week, which is a perennial question for triathletes. Generally, they think more is the answer. I mean, less is the answer. I say, they, yeah. Yeah, they think less is the answer, but more is actually the answer. Uh, but yeah, go watch that video because it does give you some decent answers and decent reasons for the answers too.